Hello, welcome once again to From Caracas. I'm Laura Prada and in this opportunity we'll be talking with Marius Frensman, who was the former Vice Foreign Minister of South Africa and he's currently the president of Moore's Tri Continental Institute. Welcome Marius, thank you for sharing with us your time. Thank you, Laura. So I want you to explain a little bit how important is it for South Africa, international cooperation, friendship, I specifically talking about Venezuela and Cuba. Let me first of all say that this is a very, very important year for South Africa because Nelson Mandela would have been 100 years old. So South Africa has celebrated right through the country, but also right through the world. At the United Nations General Assembly, there was a celebration about Nelson Mandela and what he stood for. And most importantly also, who was his friends internationally. And Madiba, you'd remember, would have said, we would never have attained our freedom and our democracy was it not for the friends of the world. Who was those friends? It was indeed so. Cuba, Venezuela, and a range of other countries. And therefore, as South Africa, we want to celebrate, not only us, we want to cele celebrate pe the people of Latin America in, in the context of our own freedom. Um, and um, the relation between Cuba, Venezuela, and South Africa next year is going to be a very important year. Why? It's the 90 year celebration of Sam Nujoma, one of the heroes that's still alive in Africa and the liberation movement from Namibia. But it's also, Namibia is also chairing the SADC, the region, the southern region, um, regional body. And thirdly, it was because of the, the comrades and the, and the revolutionaries that came to, to Angola, um, the Battle of Kitugunavala, we believe in South Africa, South Africa would never have attained our freedom was it not for the people that came to fight in solidarity, and in particular, the people of Cuba. Um, and what Fidel said was that they only took back 2,000 plus body bags. And that is the depth. It was not gold, it wasn't diamonds that they took away from Angola, it was not oil that took about back the body bags. And that is the solidarity that South Africa has seen with the people of Cuba, the people of Venezuela and, and, and the region. I want to make a particular point here that the Namibia would not have been freed was it not for the Battle of Kitugunavala. And we would not have been freed if it wasn't. And therefore, we will be celebrating. So there's a very deep history. There's a very deep context. I think you've, my, my company's name and the, the research institute's name is called Moja Tricontinental Research Institute. Mm -hmm. When Che Guevara went to Congo to fight on the ground in battle on the ground there in the 60s after the killing of um, um, Patrice Lumumba, he was light-skinned. And they decided as revolutionaries that because he's more lighter skinned, that he will be called Tatu, number three in Swahili. Then also there was a dark Cuban with him that was called Moja. Moja, because Moja means in Swahili, one or unity. That Moja, the com my research institute is dedicated to that battle that the Cubans and the internationalist has gone in to help South Africa, Africa, and Congo. And um, in this instance, it is General Victor Drecke, Commandante Drecke. So we all, it's, it's as deep as it gets to, to give honor and commitment. So we don't believe in South Africa that we can flourish. We don't believe we can have our in independence. We don't believe that we can do all the geopolitical stuff globally if we are not continuing the partnership in solidarity with the people all over the world. Nelson Mandela said, the people of South Africa should never feel they are free unless the people of Palestine is free. Talking about freedom and resistance against imperialism, today Venezuela and Cuba are facing threats from United States. How a country like South Africa, how a continent like Africa see that threats that are coming to those two countries? The threats are global. We were living in a very dangerous space because we've seen um, 
the, the, the type of inconsistencies and the type of ir recklessness behavior from the president of the US. So we've, we've seen that. I, I want also just to say we've been invited um, here, we were at the Science and Technology um, seminar event. Venezuela, you are doing brilliant work. Um, we've seen, we've walked around, we've gone to innovation, we've gone to technology people, and there's so much that the, the country is offering amidst the threat that they, they're experiencing. So we've walked in the park, and, I, and in a sense, it was like our, our team was saying, the people of South Africa should see, the people of Africa should see, the people of Europe should see, what is being gone, going on by CNN about Fox TV and others, and what's the reality of Venezuela? It doesn't match. People are free. They walk in the parks. They, they, they are joyous. They are just people wanting to live a better life. So we want to commend the leadership of Venezuela. We want to commend the president of Venezuela for that. Now, the question that you're asking about um, Africa, Africa is also under threat. Um, let me explain the South African situation. South Africa, there's this, this five countries in BRICS. Mm -hmm. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South I Africa. I want to touch, yeah. touch, touch so specifically that yeah. point. Yeah. But now, let's just show a little bit. Of okay. So the reason, the point that I'm making is if you, if you actually look at Venezuela and the aggression against Venezuela, it is essentially a regime change aggression. Mm -hmm. But it comes in different forms and different formats. And what we are saying in South Africa, we are saying, and people in Africa, and we've decided to start a union for friendship with Venezuela. So there's a decision taken. There is, as we this week in South, well, we're in Venezuela, there's a, there's a meeting in South Africa where the vice president of Venezuela, the ruling party is. And in that position, there is meetings today with the Young Communist League, and the youth of Venezuela in a province in the Eastern Cape. There is meetings of political party, the ANC, COSACHO, and the South African Communist Party. There's, there's a meeting that has taken place over the last two weeks with the liberation, former liberation movement parties in Africa, all expressing support for the people of Venezuela, all expressing support that we need to rally a solidarity campaign and a movement across the world that will essentially say that Venezuelans, you're not on your own. Venezuelans, their struggle is our struggle and, and their victory will be our victory, so we will fight together. Talking about that fights that are meant to be fought together, you started talking about Mandela and he, the, this, his anniversary. How is South Africa today, the threats that face South Africa about racism, the, the what upper hate uh, throw on the society, how is South Africa today facing those topics? We are 1994 till today, we, we've done a lot. The leadership of the country, we've attained our freedom. We've attained a very important developmental goals. So we've got a national development plan. And in that plan we are saying, the threats in South Africa, the new threats. The old threats was apartheid and racism. What is the new threats? Poverty, unemployment, and those are the type of threats that South Africa is fighting. President um, Ramaphosa, with the cabinet and with the people of South Africa, every day needs to, to tackle these issues. And, and hence, racism, um, as well as the issue of land reform, become big issues in our country. So, it, so we are now saying it's the second phase of our national democratic revolution. What is the second phase? Yes, we've attained freedom, but the fundamental issues about the economy, and therefore there's a focus to create a radical economic transformation. South Africa is a beautiful space. There is, we still have the contradictions of the globe within South Africa. Um, these people are more positive, there's more positivity engaged. Um, racism is still there, because racism is also an issue of the mind. Um, at times you can take it off the statute book, but it, it's very difficult to take it from here or from the mind. And therefore there's a particular focus to try and create opportunities 
where we create an inclusive society, both at the level of social compact, government, with the private sector and with civil society. But whilst I'm saying that, there is an onslaught on South Africa. Um, about that development that's been taking place in South Africa, while you were Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, South, Af South Africa joined the BRICS. Is South Africa still a growing economy? So is the BRICS has still have sense? Because we can, as we can see, Brazil have uh, lower their PIB. So is South Africa losing their uh, uh, their uh, touch in that development, or they are maintaining uh, South Africa is maintaining their position as one of the uh, developing countries, uh, the growing economies. Uh, I think let's let's start off by saying that BRICS was formed to create an alternative bloc of 40 percent of the world population to the IMF, the World Bank, and other Bretton Woods institutions. Mm -hmm. Those Bretton Woods institutions have shown that when they move into countries and when they invest, they actually invest in a way that cripple a country. So pragmatically and systematically, the, the, the ruling party of South Africa has said what we require is we require partners globally that we can actually put, in a sense, an alternative together. So when I was the vice minister and when we were part of the formation of the BRICS process, one of the interesting things is the analysts, the Western analysts, South Africa elite analysts were arguing, but South Africa is small. 55 million people, look at, look at China, look at Russia's population, India's population and Brazil's population. Why did South Africa want to be part of BRICS? It's not because of South Africa. South Africa do not believe that we must create wealth and opportunities only in South Africa. South Africa believe we are interdependent on Africa. So our involvement in BRICS is intricately linked to the involvement of all African countries in, in BRICS. So we're representing essentially a, a billion plus people. The, the, the question around the relevance of BRICS or not, BRICS must, we must fight that it remains relevant. We've already seen in, in Brazil, we've, we, we, we've already seen a move. There was a regime change clearly a few years ago. There was, they've used the courts, they've used the media, and they've used the ground. And we're now seeing a right-wing approach to, to Brazil in governance. That will, what we need to understand is that that possibly can spill over into an attack on similar type of issues in South Africa. Why I'm raising that point is you start to see the, the country with the biggest number of foreign agencies outside of Washington is Pretoria in South Africa. Why is it like that? You would have seen over the last five years a deliberate attempt to divide the alliance and the left wing, the left in, 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 in South Africa. You would have seen an attempt to create destruction within the ruling party. It, is, it, it doesn't come accidental. It, it, it's, it's precisely because some of us believe... It's because the left is being also um, a, a pressured around the world. That's it. So, 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 but it's a strategy because remember, if you can weaken South Africa government, mm -hmm. the only way that you can weaken South Africa government is to divide the African National Congress. It's to divide the left alliance structure. And we've seen that onslaught taking shape in our country. And therefore, what we need to do is to make sure that we all pull together. And the BRICS um, summit a few months ago in South Africa has said we must firm up and strengthen the BRICS. What's a new interesting dimension, and this is something that Moja Research Institute are, will soon be writing on and uh, pushing a view. We, we actually think it's time that it's BRICS plus and specific countries. You've just seen Mexico. Um, and the leadership of Mexico and the new, new leadership there. So some of us believe, and remember it's not a government, I'm private, right? So some of us believe Mexico and Turkey must actually join BRICS. But then we are having a different, another view into it, so that you can manage what's happening in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Because there's going to be an onslaught because it is to try and keep things like the Bretton Woods institutions. So, so we, we, we believe firmly, if you look at ge the geography of the world, Mexico is strategic to join. 
If you look at Turkey, it would be strategic to join. That has to do with the South-South cooperation? Yes, the Global South. And then the solidarity, um, some of us in the solidarity movement believe that, why is BRICS formed? It's about alternatives. It's about the impact of what the Bretton Woods Institution, who best can tell us about the, the impact of Bretton Woods Institutions than Cuba? Cuba has faced over more than 50 years that aggression, mm -hmm. systematic breaking down, and it was essentially the will of a society, the will of a people, the will of a commander-in-chief called Fidel Castro that says every citizen in Cuba is a commander-in-chief, and therefore, therefore Cuba was still standing strong. So we think that it's time that possibly BRICS Plus must also look at what is the countries that has faced Onswell. And they don't have the economic muscle but they have the political appreciation of the impact. Then you take Venezuela. Venezuela has the natural resources. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason why there's an onslaught against Venezuela. Okay. And, 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 and isn't it time that the BRICS countries are saying, why don't Venezuela and Cuba are being supported, are being nurtured, not generally, but actually by the BRICS countries. So, so we think there's time that there must be a developmental arm not necessarily the focus on the economic drivers, but on the other drivers, the geopolitical drivers. And, and, and Moja Research Institute will be agitating for Venezuela and Cuba to somehow be strategically placed linked to, to the BRICS process. I want to, you said, uh, the global, you talk about the global south. And now Telesur, down Telesur English, is developing, uh, sending its signal to Africa and calling it, the global, connecting the global south. So how is seen Latin America in Africa? Latin America, there is a, there's a direct link. Um, because as you'd know, people move from Africa, not by choice, um, across the globe and in particular to this part of the regions. It was, there was slavery, there was discrimination, there was oppression, there were serious battles fought. And, and therefore a person from Latin America Somehow can't be truly non-African because if you go back in time and if you go back in roots, and 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 there is that link. What what the opportunity? What is the problem in terms of connectivity, distance, language, and culture? What can overcome distance, language, and culture? We want to commend um, your your institution, Talasur, for taking a decision to move into Africa especially the fact that it's English because, you know, some of us would be completely um, in, unable to appreciate the, the depth of, 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 of it. We've seen some of the programs and, and what we've now picked up is that embassies, not, I'm not speaking Venezuela, not speaking Cuban embassies, solidarity organizations in Africa, solidarity organizations in Saudi, governments, take, um, and the COSATU, COSATU in September took a resolution um, in the Congress to support Talasur in Africa. Alliance organizations like POP, um, the, the, the Union for Police, the Union for um, Health Workers, etc., in South Africa, took similar resolutions. So there's a wave taking shape. So, so it seems to us that Talasur also have this, this ability to bring Latin America to Africa, to bring Africa to Latin America. Not government, government, but people, people as well. Now to start closing ideas, I, I wanted you to, tell, to talk to me uh, about three men that uh, were of their figures transcended history. Mandela, of course, Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. How those, the ideas of those three men about um, solidarity, internationalism, about um, union of um, force to, to face imperialism, how those men should be seen today, not only in Latin America and Africa, but for in the world? Every time when we see in Cape Town, this most southern tip of South Africa, when, you, we, when we see a protest against elitism, the faces of, 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 of those three men, um, and people like Che Guevara and others, 
will feature in those protests. When we are seeing in places like Botswana, where there was a discussion on how do you get it a more progressive and more uh, a, a reorientated space, you would see, for example, on the ground, citizens of communities where there's poverty, injustice, etc., seeing hope and seeing a vision that people, and especially young people, would be able to claim that indeed so. It is these three leaders that gave us the theoretical appreciation, the visionary analysis, and the hope and the aspirations to essentially follow um, that particular lead. So yes, they're indeed an example. I hope one day, I hope one day, that we can see actually a film, not a documentary, but one day a film about them and their views and their aspirations, playing it out, out then, but also what, what if they would have been around in this modern um, um, global village um, situation? What would have been their views around things? And that, so yes, it's, it's much appreciated. It actually is the, the flag that carries peoples across the world in the fight uh, against injustice. Just to, and now to close, uh, finally, which are the perspective, economically speaking, not only for South Africa, but also for Africa? Which are the? The perspective. The, the, okay. Of the, economical, yeah, okay. social, yeah. political perspective of Africa. There is, Africa's got 54, 54 countries plus. One, two, it's got one billion plus people. Just in the south, in, in, in 15 countries around South Africa, there is hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of intra-trade opportunities. This year we've just signed, through the African Union, countries have just signed an agreement to do intra-trade. We've signed a partnership also with China, in the context of um, FOCAC, which is China-Africa relation. So the prospects are, are very good. At least five or six of the, out of the 10 growing cities in the world you're gonna find in Africa. But, but if you look at the map of Africa, you will see all the roads lead to the harbors. Why? Because historically, it was positioned that the raw material must leave the shores of Africa to go somewhere else and then come back in a refined product where people then buy it again and again. So, so the opportunities are great and we're calling on people to invest in Africa. We're calling on people to invest in the skills development in Africa, the tourism, um, the economy, the infrastructure. We've got what we've got special economic zones in South Africa and also in different parts of Africa. And what we are looking for is strategic partners that can take that debate forward. Thank you very much, Marius. Thanks, Laura. For sharing with us those ideas and those uh, thoughts of what comes uh, for Africa and for South Africa. Thanks so much. Thank you for you for watching us today in from, the, from Caracas. And we've been talking with Marius Frensman, who was the Vice Chancellor of uh, South Africa and who is currently the President of More Strike Continental. Thank you for watching us. Thank you.